We are continuing the program with um, the first afternoon session. Uh, in, in this first session, the topic is going to be Finland's and Sweden's different approaches uh, to investment screening. And we were supposed to have actually another person originally here uh, talking, Björn Kappelin, but he has just uh, re recently been uh, uh, or received a, a new um, a prestigious appointment and he was unfortunately not able to join us. Instead, we have another equally uh, distinguished uh, uh, colleague from Sweden, Stockholm, uh, who, with whom we have worked also on, on this project. Uh, Oskar Almen, he's a senior researcher. He is the head of the Asia program at the uh, Swedish Defense Research Agency, FOI. He has a background also as an associate professor of political science at Uppsala University. He has researched uh, Chinese politics for over 20 years and has authored a number of peer-reviewed uh, articles on the topic. Uh, since moving to FOI in 2019, his research focused on Chinese politics and security policy in China and East Asia. And in this capacity, he has authored several research reports covering different aspects of foreign investment in Sweden including service of Chinese and Russian investments, Chinese economic influence in the Nordic region, and security risks related to Chinese and Russian investments. Oscar will first re present a recent report that he has um, published. And after that, we will have Lisa telling about um, uh, uh, her uh, work uh, together with um, the other colleague, Bjorn Kapelin, uh, comparing Finland's and Sweden's approaches. And then we will have some comments from the uh, uh, governmental sector, Lasse Puroma, is going to provide uh, his comments and remarks uh, primarily on, on Lisa's presentation, after which we have again the possibility to uh, ask questions and discuss. And I remind you once more that we have that bowl that seems to be a bit empty still, so please do fill the bowl so we have something to work with in the afternoon session. Without further ado, um, Oscar, uh, please, I hope we can make this technically work. So Oscar will run the slides. Uh, from there, uh, where he's sitting in, in Stockholm. Yeah. Please, Oscar. Thank you very much. I'll uh, just hope that it works. So, can you all see uh, the, the slide, Chinese investments in Sweden now? Okay. Well, that's that's uh, quite common, I think, when it comes to these video conferences. It always end up with some kind of problem. Anyway, so uh, thank you very much for having me here uh, and talk about this report. So uh, Chinese investments in Sweden. This is actually a, a well. This is actually a um, one study in a number of studies that we, that, that we have done at FOI looking at foreign investments. So. Uh, the original study uh, was done in 2019, where we did a, a first uh, study of Chinese corporates acquisitions in Sweden. So this study that I'm presenting today is a, is a follow-up on that, uh, but also a, a broadening of, of that previous study. And some other studies that were done, uh, FDI in critical sectors, which was a part of the work of the Swedish screening mechanism. Uh, China's economic influence in the Arctic region, uh, where I looked at, at uh, China's economic influence in the Nordic region. We also looked at Russian investments and economic interest in Sweden last year. Uh, and this report that I'm presenting today, then, Chinese Investments in Sweden, a survey, is um, uh, a study that was published in, in June, uh, and uh, it's available to download from, from our homepage, so if, if you're interested. Uh, so this study then, uh, well, the, the main purpose of this study, first of all, there was uh, a demand uh, that, the, that we did an update from the previous studies in 2019 to see what had happened. Um, also, the main problem uh, was that the, there is a huge debate on, on the possible risks and, and benefits and, and uh, problems of Chinese investments, but there's very little information on and statistics on, on the actual situation. Of what do Chinese companies actually own in Sweden? So uh, publicly available statistics uh, wasn't very, very useful. Uh, so the main purpose is to, is, is to construct this list 
So in the end of, of this report, we uh, list all these different companies uh, and, then, uh, and name them. So the main work here has been to actually collect the data and present it. And one advantage that we have had in, in this is uh, to use the Swedish company registration office register of beneficial owners, where all companies in Sweden have to report their beneficial owner, uh, except for publicly traded companies. Um, now, this uh, data then resulted in, in, in a huge amount of, 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 uh, of, of, of companies uh, that had a Chinese citizen as a beneficial owner, uh, probably around 2000. Uh, but most of those are, are not of interest at all. It's, it's not a Chinese company owning a Swedish company. It's more like, a, in many cases, Chinese citizens living in, in Sweden starting restaurants. So there was a lot of work in, in, in trying to figure out which ones are actually acquisitions or other kinds of investments from, from, from China to Sweden. Uh, in addition to that, uh, because not all companies actually register their beneficial owner in this system, although they should, uh, uh, there's a lot of added information from media, and we also looked at all these different um, uh, yearly reports from, from the companies. Um, what the, the um, uh, commonly, when we look, when when studies are done on, on foreign investments, you use uh, investment statistics. Uh, but if you look at investment statistics uh, in Sweden, Chinese investments only uh, amount to 78 billion Swedish crowns. Uh, so that tells you something what they actually paid when they did the investment. But I thought it would well, it was more interesting to to actually look at the assets of, the, uh, of these companies, the value of the companies. So. I've, instead use turnover and, and assets, in, and uh, that give, gave a, a totally different picture. So, for example, Volvo, the acquisition of Volvo was mm, uh, 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 estimated to be 1.8 billion US dollars uh, in 2010. But the value of Volvo, just in terms of, of the stock market value, is uh, more than 10 times that value. Uh, I also only include companies with assets or turnover above 2 million Swedish crowns. So the results then of this uh, survey. Um, so we, uh, I've looked at uh, the extent of Chinese investments, but also, also what kind of different sectors and uh, technology areas that they affect. So uh, identify 90 Swe uh, Chinese acquisitions of parent companies in Sweden. Uh, 70 of these companies are majority acquisitions, and then 20 are minority. Actually, that's not correct. It should be 69 are majority acquisitions and 21 are minority posts. It's wrong in the slide. Um, also, as of February 2023, then 21 of these uh, 90 companies have uh, are not actively the Chinese-owned uh, companies anymore. They have either gone bankrupt or been sold to, to non-Chinese uh, owners, which leaves then 69 Chinese parent companies. And out of these, 53 are majority acquisitions and 16 are minority posts. Um, also, we didn't, uh, we only looked at, at parent companies but there is also a number of, of subsidiaries that come along with these uh, acquisitions, and in speci uh, specifically and, and in particular when it comes to Volvo, of course. Uh, so Li Shufu is a beneficial owner of more than 100 companies in, in Sweden, but most of those are, are subsidiaries and, uh, in, in the Volvo acquisition, and we didn't count them singularly. They are included in the Volvo acquisition. In addition to this, I also list 53 Chinese greenfield investments, newly established companies, which we didn't do the previous study. So in total, this gives us 122 active Chinese-owned parent companies in Sweden. And the total number of jobs in Sweden connected to these majority-owned uh, companies, uh, I think it's only relevant to look at, 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 at works when it comes to, to majority-owned companies is close to 35,000, and of course, main, mainly in Volvo, then, Volvo cars. 
Now, this chart here shows the number of Chinese acquisitions over time, and we can see a, a familiar pattern here where, where there is a top uh, 2016 to 2019, and particularly 2017, in the number of acquisitions uh, and that they have gone down in recent years. So this follows the trend that you can see in Chinese ac uh, acquisitions and investments in, um, in Europe. Uh, but there's actually been a trend from acquisitions towards greenfield investments. You can see that in Sweden too. When it comes to the value of these Chinese investments then, uh, the total assets of the companies, both in, in greenfield and, and acquisition, is more than 400 billion Swedish crowns. That would be about 40 billion US dollars. And the total turnover, uh, more than 300 a billion Swedish crowns. And uh, it's very interesting when you look at these figures that, that the, to see the, the total dominance of Trajan Gili, who is then the owner of Volvo. Uh, they don't only own, own Volvo, they also have established a number of other companies uh, and uh, also have a, sh a strong share of, of the Volvo trucks. So the total asset ownership of Geely is 80% of all these uh, company assets of, of, of these Chinese acquisitions or companies. And 56% is uh, Volvo cars, the ownership in Volvo cars, which is 80% ownership. So without Geely's investments in Sweden, the, the, the value of Chinese investments would be quite uh, limited. Okay, so... Um, I also did look at uh, the different sectors. Are you, do, you, do you see this slide now? Most common sectors for Chinese investments? Yes. Yes. So I also looked at, at what different sectors these investments were made in. And uh, you can see that uh, information and communication technology, health and biotechnology, and industrial products and machinery were the dominant when it came to acquisitions. So it's a bit different when you look at Greenfield. This is not surprising at all, since it's, these are areas where Sweden is strong and where, where China has shown an interest. Maybe uh, a bit more interesting is that I also did a comparison with the Chinese industry strategy made in China 2025, and uh, which is a strategy then for uh, areas high tech areas where China has uh, said that it wants to be self-sufficient and in some cases uh, dominant. Uh, uh, so there's some indication what uh, sectors China really wants to um, uh, focus on. And there's a correlation between the, the, the uh, operations of some of these companies and these technological sectors. When it comes to acquisitions, it's uh, almost 60% of the of, of the companies that are involved in in uh, either one one of these sectors, and you can see that new information technology is uh, one of the most dominant, and and then power equipment is another one. Tencent is one uh, another company that has been particularly active in Sweden. They acquire, have acquired nine companies or or ownership at least in nine uh, companies, among many uh, which are gaming development companies, which uh, is interesting in itself, uh, because it's particular security aspects related to, to the gaming industry. I'm not going to dwell on that too much, since I, I don't think I have that much time. Some additional findings then. Uh, so I was looking as I was uh, at instead of investments, uh, uh, statistics, I was using then assets and, and the total uh, Chinese ownership of, of, of uh, company assets makes up almost 2% of all the company assets in Sweden, and the turnover is even larger than 3.2%. So that, that, that shows that, that the, the value of, of Chinese-owned companies are quite large. Um, Comparatively, the, then, if you look at only the investment statistics, uh, Chinese investments only make up 2% of all foreign direct investments, which, of course, then it would be a, a far less uh, influential. And also, in terms of number of companies, uh, China is far, uh, further down the list since China hasn't been an active uh, investor in Sweden for, for that long. So I, I think it's the same in all other countries. Um, although I know that... Uh, in, in the number of companies acquired in Sweden is, is uh, 
quite large compared to other countries in Europe. So China has acquired a lot of smaller companies in Sweden, many startups. Uh, finally, then, uh, what happened since the last survey in 2019? Well, there's been an addition of 30 new uh, corporate acquisitions, but also during the same time, 10 companies have either went bank uh, gone bankrupt or sold. Nordic Cinema is one example of a, a company that's been sold, and also big companies uh, uh, that were owned by Evergrande, the, the, the real estate company that's now in, in a big crisis and need to sell off many other assets. So they are not no longer in, in Chinese ownership. So it, you can say lately we haven't really seen an increase in Chinese investments. Uh, although we, saw, we see new acquisitions, we also see them selling off some, some assets. Also, uh, from, a, from a security uh, point of view, many of these investments include areas such as wind power, semiconductors, robotics, and coastal surveillance companies. So I think the uh, screening mechanism is very timely. Uh, these were companies that have been acquired that would definitely be a, a, a part of the screening uh, process in Sweden, I would argue. So thank you very much. I'm sorry for the technical problems. Thank you, Oscar. I think that was an, an excellent background to bring us up to date also on the situation in Sweden with regard to Chinese investments. And, and you ended on the, the upcoming uh, uh, investment screening uh, procedures or a new, new legislation on that in Sweden, which is per a perfect bridge to our next presentation. Uh, Lisa is going to tell us about um, the recent study that she did where uh, she compared together with uh, Björn Kappelin um, the Swedish and the Finnish investment screening legislation and policies. So today I'll be talking about Finland's and Sweden's different approaches to investment screening and their implications for Chinese investments. So the presentation is based on a Finnish-Swedish collaborative study that FORAC conducted in collaboration with the Swedish National China Center, NKK, at the Swedish Institute for International Affairs. In practice, Björn Kappelin and I wrote a report called The China Dilemma in Foreign Investment Screening, comparing the, the Finnish and Swedish approaches, which was published in NKK's report series last June. Basically, the study had two purposes. It presented a comparative content analysis of the existing and upcoming national legislations and then assessed and anticipated their implications to Chinese investments. In addition to studying the legislative documents and proposals in detail, we also had a chance to conduct interviews in both countries. Most importantly, we interviewed the national state agencies responsible for screening the Security of Supply and Resilience Team at the Ministry for Work and Employment in Finland, and the Inspectorate for Strategic Products in Sweden. And then just a few words about the structure of today's presentation. To clarify my argumentation, I'll begin by going straight to the point, to the similarities and differences between Finnish and Swedish national FDI legislations. I'll then continue to discussing the extent to which the key differences um, of these national mechanisms will have an impact on Chinese investments. And then I'll conclude with final words. Um, the first clear difference between the two mechanisms is that the Finnish Act on the screening of foreign corporate acquisitions came into force as early as 2012, so clearly at a time when interdependence was not yet thought to be weaponized and foreign acquisitions were not riskified to any clear extent. This mechanism was then amended and modified into its current form in October 2020 when the EU's investment screening regulation came into force and encouraged the member states to set up national FDI screening mechanisms on the grounds of security and public order and to facilitate information of uh, exchange of information between countries. Sweden's act on the screening of foreign direct investments, in turn, is only about to enter into force this December. Sweden is actually one of the last member states to adopt a national FDI controls, and quite interestingly, the mechanism constitutes the first screening le legislation that the country has had for 30 years. 
And because it was drafted from scratch, not amended like the Finnish one, and much of the careful prep preparation and research was conducted under the current security challenges, I would say that this law is very much a product of a time characterized by riskification of foreign investments. And quite notably, according to our interviews, strategic, Chinese strategic interviews, investments were a major independent driver for this national process, unlike was the case in Finland back in the late 2010s when our law was amended. Then if we take a look at the location of screening, we recognized another clear difference. Basically, in Finland, the location of screening is the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Employment, and especially its Security of Supply and Resilience team of the Department of Employment and Well-Functioning Markets. So the key expertise of the location of screening is in Finland is is in economic aspects of investments, and rather tellingly, the same ministry that does screening is also responsible for attracting investment to Finland. In Sweden, in turn, the location of screening will be at the Inspectorate for Strategic Products. It's the agency under the Ministry for Foreign Affairs that is also responsible for export controls, and it has a long history of considering the security aspects of economic interdependence. It's also noteworthy that having an agency instead of a ministry as the location for screening is quite exceptional in, by international standards. It can basically be explained by Sweden's constitutional requirement for this type of reg regulatory process to be, the, to be the remit of an expert level agency. Then when it comes to covered industries and fields, we notice that Sweden lists a lot more covered fields. While the Finnish mechanism covers acquisitions made in the defense and security industries, as well as other industries critical for vital functions of society, the Swedish mechanism basically covers all these and more. The ones highlighted in blue, production of critical raw materials, emerging or strategic protected technologies, and activities processing large amounts of data represent those fields that are not explicitly mentioned in the Finnish mechanism. However, I think it's quite important to note that these Finnish categories of screen industries are rather vague and their actual content is defined by prevailing national aims which are set out in separate documents. This means that, if need be, they could cover more than meets the eye and all, the, and, and all three of the above mentioned types of investments could be made subject of screening in Finland too. Both raw materials and emerging technologies can be considered supply security relevant, while software that gathers data can be considered to have dual use potential. And when it comes to covered types of investments, the difference between the national mechanisms is clear. Finland cover covers acquisitions only, where Sweden monitors both acquisitions and greenfield investments. New foreign companies set up in Finland. Both countries use the international standard definition of FDI by setting the threshold for screening at 10% of shares or other corresponding actual influence in the target. Basically, this means that venture capital investments are generally not monitored in either country unless they produce defense or dual-use products. And then if we look at the covered nationalities of investors, in the Finnish Act, Foreign generally refers to non-EU EFTA investors, but in the case of defense industry acquisitions, um, it covers all non-Finnish entities. This general scope frees most Europeans from screening and means, for example, that also investors with a golden passport are not subject to formal screening. Golden pa passport holders are those individuals who have obtained an EU passport from a member state that offers citizenships in exchange for notable investments. Currently, such schemes are offered by Malta, Portugal and Cyprus, for example. And then in Sweden, the Act will require all investments, including Swedish, including Swedish in the covered fields to be subject of notification. The aim of this kind of broad scope seems to be identify harmful foreign influ influence through local frontmen. This also means that in practice, most acquisitions made by Swedes are ex expected to be exempt from more detailed screening. And then, um, against the backdrop of all these differences, it can be argued that the underlying security priorities of these mechanisms also somewhat differ. 
Finland's decision to locate screening within the security of supply and resilience team of a ministry whose key competence is in economic, economic affairs and also the focus on ac acquisitions that could result in disruptions to provision and production of critical supplies and services all indicate that a strong priority is given to supply security. In addition, International security is also clearly a priority because screening of defense industry acquisitions mitigates the risk of an uncontrolled outflow of weapons and dual-use products. Sweden's location of screening, the ISP, covers fields, uh, co covered fields, the decision to screen not only acquisitions but also greenfield investments and the great effort to detect investors using local frontmen indicates that on top of the same dimensions of security as Finland is prioritizing, the Swedish mechanism is also putting a strong focus on broader national security. A mitigation of risks stemming from malicious and strategic intentions of foreign investors. In fact, the proposal that outlined the draft for the law even explicitly underlined the need to target strategic acquisitions with screening functions. And okay, so that, that much for, this, uh, for the key similarities and differences, and then we proceed to discuss what they mean in the context of Chinese investments. Uh, and we'll start with the impact of covered industries. Although the past is not always a great compass, it can be helpful to start with a very brief take on the nature of the rather recent investments that the Chinese companies have made in Finland and Sweden and see if they fall within the covered industries of the national mechanisms. Oscar already touched upon this point in his presentation, but I'll um, provide a brief um, recap. Basically, since 2020, the industries that Chinese companies have invested in have included such fields as health and life sciences, ICT, including game industry, energy industry, electronics, including semiconductors, retail, consumer business, robotics, and surveillance. Most of these fields constitute strategic emerging industries of the Chinese economy, key focus areas for Chinese economic development, as outlined by the National Development and Reform Commission and other ministries in China in, back in 2020. And then if we look at the field screened, uh, the, if we look at the field screened by Finland, it is clear that a vast majority of these Chinese acquisitions have not been made in the industries covered by the national mechanism. This is also evident in that only a handful of Chinese investments have been screened so far. In Sweden, in turn, various recent Chinese investments would have been subject to screening, as Oscar mentioned, if the mechanism had already been in place. To some extent, this is due to the addition of the activities highlighted in blue, because many activities actually fall within their scope. For example, mobile game, mobile game companies that process large amounts of data, uh, large amounts of personal data, location data, would have been subject to screening. And then if we anticipate what the investment trends will be like in the future, we can actually assume that the concentration on ICT, electronics, biotechnology and other industries associated with the strategic emerging industries of the Chinese economy will actually continue and even strengthen. This is because in recent years the Chinese government has been less encouraging regarding FDI outflows and companies have had fewer incentives to move capital out of China due to decreasing pressures from currency depreciation. In practice, this means that there are fewer investments and these are directed at the most essential sectors. In terms of the differences made by the covered field industries, this will mean that Sweden will most likely screen more Chinese investments in the future, unless the three port fields covered by the Finnish mechanism are redefined. Uh, and we'll continue with the impact of covered types of investments. In the past, Chinese companies acquired clearly more companies than established new ones in Europe. And this preference has been typical in China's encounters with advanced economies in general. However, this trend may now be changing, possibly par partly because acquisitions are debated more intensively, and at the EU level, Chinese companies actually made more EU-bound greenfield investments than acquisitions already last year. 
As Oscar already pointed out, this shift is evidently also visible in Finland and Sweden, where an increasing number of greenfield investments have been made, especially in energy industry, clean tech, ICT and consumer business. In addition, Chinese companies make a notable amount of venture capital investments in Europe. VC investments differ from FDI in that the ownership share established with these deals is less than 10%. Notably, according to the Rodion Group and Merix, Sweden's share of these capital flows was as high as 121 million in 2021, which constituted a peak year in China's VC investment activity in Europe. In Finland, data on Chinese VC investments is scattered and hard to find, but for example, Tencent has invested in the Finnish quantum computing firm IQM. In any case, the fact that only acquisitions are screened in Finland means that these rising trends of Chinese investment activity are largely uncovered in the Finnish system. In Sweden, where both acquisitions and greenfield investments will be covered, a majority of recent Chinese investments would have been within the mechanism scope. These investments would have flown under the Swedish radar as well. And when it comes to the third key difference, covered nationalities and its effect on Chinese investments. It's, pro it's probably very clear by now that Chinese investors themselves are covered in both mechanisms, but it, is, but it is the more fussy ownership structures and the use of proxies and local frontmen that may make this difference relevant for Chinese investments. Basically, it's possible for Chinese investors to make investments to an EU domiciled company in which it is difficult to detect any Chinese ownership. One of our interviewees also pointed out that the use of local frontmen is a practice favored by some Chinese investors, especially in the current atmosphere. There, the person making the investment is local, but the actual influence is exerted by a Chinese investor. However, using such proxies has become more difficult under the current media scrutiny faced by China and with the resources now available to the security police. Uh, then a third relevant option here is that a Chinese investor has a golden passport which makes his or her investment an EU investment. This is, however, the least likely option because Chinese passport holders cannot have dual citizenships. If they obtain, say, a Malta passport, they must give up on their original Chinese passport. In any case, investments made through such, arrange such arrangements may not be notified or noticed in Finland because the Act covers acquisitions made by non-EU EFTA nationals only, with the notable exception of defence industry, of course. But having said that, it's also important to point out, point out that this does not make the state completely toothless. If it really is a Chinese investor who ultimately ends up controlling the company and the Finnish authorities later learn about the deal and found out that a key national interest would so require, it is possible to cancel the acquisition retroactively if it is located within the screened industries. In, in 2020, the Finnish Act was also amended by a new provision which makes it possible for the Ministry to request a transaction to be brought to its examination if circumvention of the Act is evident. And then when it comes to Sweden, the decision to cover all investor nationalities should of course put the country in an ideal position to tackle all these fuzzy ownership arrangements. In practice, this means that the Swedish system therefore emphasizes that potentially dangerous deals could originate from anywhere and the authorities should be notified about any FDI in the screen fields, be the investor Swedish, Finnish or Chinese. However, given that in practice most investments made by Swedish nationals are exempt from a more detailed screening process, it might be assumed that Swedes are covered in the mechanism only to warn those investors seeking to use the above-mentioned proxy arrangements. The problem with this deterrence effect is that it creates a major administrative burden which could overload the system. And actually, quite paradoxically, it's possible that the proposed Swedish system might actually attract Chinese investors to use proxies with Swedish nationality since their acquisitions are subject to notification, but in effect escape closure scrutiny. And then just a few final thoughts. So one of the key arguments here is that due to its extensive scope and broader national security focus, the Swedish system is likely to cover a larger number of future Chinese investments. In practice, as we have seen, it screens more industries, types of FDI and nationalities of investors. 
In my opinion, the possible takeaways, food for thought, for Finland are the following. First, Finland should consider covering greenfield investments. Second, Finland should extend the screened categories in the legislation to explicitly cover, cover at least the activities processing large amounts of sensitive data. Another option would be to re redefine the concrete content of the screened industries in the separate documents indicating the national aims. Third, I'd be quite hesitant to expand the scope of screened nationalities because of the vast administrative burden and its impact on the investment climate. Even if the process is smooth and fast, by definition, such controls are a hindrance to investments. If we are to attract investments in the future as well, caution should be exercised with any restrictions because they do send a strong message to all investors, not only the ones that make risky investments. This is because investment decisions are not only made based on facts and real features of investment screening mechanisms, but also based on mere impressions. If Finland actually adopted the proposed changes, it would mean that the underlying security priorities guiding the screening system would also expand to cover broader national security concerns. The risks of greenfield investments and activities covering large amounts of sensitive data go beyond disruptions to provision and production of critical supplies and services. And then finally, it should be noted that it is actually not at all obvious that Sweden's investment screening mechanism would automatically mitigate China-related security risks better than Finland's more liberal stance. For one, investment screening is just one form of state oversight, and there are, for example, complementary legislations that cover FDI screening's gaps. This is actually an issue that one of our Swedish Delphi panelists pointed out by arguing that, in his view, broader security implications should definitely be tackled with security policy, not FDI screening. I think that might also reflect the Finnish view to some extent. And then second, it should be noted that FDI screening mechanisms are never completely exhaustive. They're designed with particular potential dangers in mind, but these risks are mainly known unknowns, possible developments that governments are all, can already imagine. They don't cover unknown unknowns or unthinkable knowns, which constitute risks that governments are either not aware or simply just not wanting to consider. In a sense, it is these risks that put national mechanisms to a true test, and in such circumstances, the most security-enhancing feature of a mechanism is likely to be its adaptability to different risk environments. A potential unthinkable known that could Finland and Sweden's ability to tackle China-originated risky flows to the test would be the much speculated situation in which China moves to take violent action against Taiwan. If the West then sought to minimize or cut economic ties with China, as is, as is often anticipated, Finland and Sweden would need to have legal ways to greatly reduce Chinese FDI. In other words, the screening mechanism should allow the government to react to the changing security situation and adjust the scope of screening from more liberal to more extensive or in other situations in the other direction. Ultimately, reserving this leeway for the government is a matter of critical importance because unlike in authoritarian states, in liberal democracies, laws are binding in all circumstances. Thank you. That was some package of information for you on, on investment screening. I bet you hadn't, most of you, known much of that, or at least all of it. Uh, and now, uh, following uh, the research side on, on this, uh, comparing this to investment screening or evolving investment screening mechanism, we get to hear from uh, the practitioner side. One of the very uh, best placed persons in Finland to, to, to discuss this, we have here Lasse Purama, who is a senior specialist uh, uh, in the Ministry of Economic uh, Affairs and Employment. Uh, uh, and he leads the National Foreign Investment Screening uh, Application Process and is the vice chair of the National FDI Screening Network. Uh, Purama has also worked uh, with EU single market policy questions as a senior specialist at the ministry. And previously, he worked as a commercial secretary at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs with questions related to trade policy, trade in services, FDI, and establishment of foreign companies. So he is, I guess, uh, one of the most best placed persons to comment uh, on Lisa's presentation in Finland. Please, Lasse. 
thank you for the introduction, Mikael, and good afternoon to everyone. And thank you, Lisa and Oscar, for your presentations. They were both uh, really, really interesting. Uh, I will concentrate in my comments on uh, Lisa and Björn's paper and the differences between the uh, Finnish and forthcoming Swedish uh, FDI screening mechanisms. And as Mikael said, my perspective here is um, sort of a regulator's perspective. Uh, now, Finland has a, a long history in investment screening, and Sweden is sort of a newcomer in this field. Uh, but if we look deeper, uh, that's not quite the case, as we saw in Mikael's introduction. Uh, the Finnish uh, 1948 uh, restriction legislation was actually modeled from the 1916 Swedish corresponding legislation. Uh, the difference, of course, is that uh, Finland kept the foreign con investment controls in place, uh, whereas Sweden uh, repealed the controls as non necessary in the early 1990s. Uh, an interesting notion in the study is that uh, Finland's operational FDA legislation is an example of a more liberal approach um, compared to the Swedish, Swedish one. And this is very, really interesting because just a few years ago the uh, Finnish FDA screening legislation was considered to be uh, very extensive, even a benchmark for, for some countries. And now it stands in international comparison as the liberal approach. So what has, what has happened here? Uh, well, of course, many countries that did not have any uh, screening mechanisms introduced new ones, and the ones that had a long history in investment screening updated their mechanisms, which actually meant uh, widening the scope of the mechanisms and lowering thresholds. Uh, the trigger for these amendments uh, and introduction of new, new mechanisms was, of course, uh, the rapid changes in the security environment. But at the same time, uh, the scope of the Finnish screening mechanism is still, in essence, uh, unchanged from the introduction of the legislation uh, more than 10 years ago. It was introduced in uh, 2012. So it could be said that the the scope reflects the uh, pre-geoeconomic era approach. So there is certainly a need to reevaluate the scope of the Finnish FDS screen legislation and take into account the change in security environment. And this process has already started. And this study certainly gives ideas for us in this process. Um, and it's quite, quite right as stated in the study that the objectives of the screening process in Finland are concentrated in safeguarding the provisions of sufficient amounts of critical supplies and services in all circumstances. Whereas the Swedish screening mechanism has sort of broader national security objectives uh, regarding the targets of the screening. Now, the Finnish approach could be said is quite practical. Uh, but it's possible to take into account also foreign security policy objectives, for example, if the target is a uh, dual-use item company, a company that produces dual-use items, uh, then uh, that's enough. There doesn't have to be a link to supply security, for example. Now, the, uh, the China dilemma is, is, of course, evident for both countries, but generally it's not just China. Uh, investment screening is always about striking the right balance between openness and the ability to ident identify and, if necessary, uh, block or mitigate uh, a transaction on a national security basis. So China is no exception, uh, but it's a prime example of this trade-off, because the risks related to Chinese investments in general are so apparent today, whether it's unwanted dependencies in critical supply chains or transfer of sensitive dual-use technology. Uh, these combinations of restrictiveness and openness uh, should vary depending on the prevailing security environment. And there are different ways to construct the combinations. In general, a flexible investment screening mechanism adapts to the changes in security environment swiftly, but the trade-off is limitations to predictability and legal certainty. 
Both Finland and Sweden have uh, adopted more of the flexible option without detailed sector listings that many countries use. Although the Swedish mechanism seems to be more specific in this regard, especially targeting emerging technologies, which is somewhat difficult under the current Finnish legislation if there's no connection to supply security or do export control, for example. Uh, now the biggest difference is between the, the Finnish legislation and the uh, Swedish one uh, we just told, told us, and I would like to highlight uh, especially two. Uh, the one is the definition of foreign investor, and the other one is the sc screening authority. Well, I'm not going into details here, but it's quite a novel approach to screen also intra-Swedish transactions. Uh, it's a very robust way to prevent circumvention of the screening legislation, but might certainly turn out to be quite burdensome. And it's also exceptional that in Sweden, screening is done by an independent government agency. Uh, and usually, if you, when we're talking about uh, investment screening, we are talking about risks to national security, which in extreme form mean risks and threats to the existence of a country, which are, of course, of highest political priority. So it's quite logical that the decisions are done at the highest political level. But there are pros and cons in both, both options. Uh, the Finnish FDI screening legislation will be reformed in the following years as well. It is stated in the government program that the Act on the Screening of Foreign Corporate Acquisition will be reformed to better take into account risks relating to national security, security of supply, and wine-drenching influence activities, meaning hybrid threats. Now, the Swedish legislation could once again be a one reference point here, whether Finland will go more in the direction of the Swedish approach remains to be seen, but it will be interesting to see uh, how the Swedish system will work uh, in practice. Uh, I will conclude here and thank you for your attention. Thank you. And we have a, a, sh a few minutes uh, time for questions directly related to these presentations. And, uh, Oscar uh, needs to leave very soon, so uh, preferably if you have something directed to Oscar, then uh, please ask those questions first, otherwise you can direct uh, later uh, your questions to the other panelists. And I, again, I, I remind you about the bowl, so if there's something that you didn't ask now, you can ask or put it there and it will be dealt with later in the final discussion. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it was actually a, a mix uh, of, uh, uh, I don't know actually how, how many macro zips in total. Uh, the one that I was mentioning, 10, is the number of companies that are no longer active Chinese investments. And some of those are actually, they just sold the company to a non-Chinese owner. But but if you look at, at some of these bankruptcies, uh, well, it, I think it's different reasons uh, for, for them. I mean, sometimes obviously the, the, the company just, couldn't fly. So I don't think there's any particular related to those bankruptcies. I, I just think it was, you know, ordinary uh, <laughs> problems, economic problems for, for the companies. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I don't think there's a, a particular connection to, to why they were went bankrupt. Not, not that I can see, at least. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? So I think one reason is the the focus of these kind of investments. Many of these greenfield investments are in energy, the energy sector. So like batteries, for example. So we have a number of greenfield investments in battery production in Sweden. We also have in other parts of Europe. And I think this is this is a new field that that is is quite dominant among when it, in terms of value among among the greenfield investments. Uh, but there's probably a number of other reasons as well. But I think also one reason why the acquisitions are less uh, uh, than previously is also, I think Lisa mentioned it, it's also a policy from, from the Chinese uh, state that they many of the acquisitions that were made were considered uh, not that wise and economically unsound acquisitions. So it's, it's administrative, administrative regulations from the Chinese side trying to, to limit 
uh, and to, to to make kind of a smarter acquisitions than, than previously. So that's two 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 aspects here. Yes, so. Th I totally agree with Oscar, but there has also been a lot of speculation that the fact that in many national mechanisms, greenfield investments fly under the radar, that might also be one of the reasons why they are being favored. That has been a speculation. Any more immediate questions to the panelists? So as a screening official, I'm kind of thinking, what do you think are the benefits of sort of locating the screening agency in an independent government agency, like the ISP? What do you think are the benefits? Well, of course, it's an independent organization, and it's at least in theory sort of isolated from political pressures, which then could lead to a more consistent decision making. Uh, the, uh, the cons, of course, are that there might be some cases that are politically extremely sensitive. And then it's uh, really interesting to see how the firewall in Sweden actually works. Will, will the uh, government try, <laughs> try to affect the decisions by this independent ministry? I guess not, because I believe it's in this constitution of Sweden that that's, that's going to be done, but uh, the situation might be quite tricky. Thank you. I think we need, unfortunately, to move on now. So uh, please join me in giving hands to the three panelists, one of which unfortunately left already. And we move directly to the next uh, session. Uh, in case you wondered uh, why, we also have here uh, a section that it has the title Challenges in China's Domestic Innovation Ecosystem. This was actually uh, because um, we arranged uh, early on in the project a stakeholder um, a seminar where we, we uh, sort of uh, presented the initial ideas, the research plan, what we're going to do, and then asked ask for feedback uh, from some of our stakeholders to see what they uh, thought about this and, and also is there something that we're missing or should do. And one very strong um, uh, idea that came from there is that um, um, we know or think at least we know what is going on in, in Sweden with legislation and policy, but we also need to understand what is going on in China. So that's why we had a, a separate small strand of this project that was looking into uh, the, what is going on in, in China's innovation ecosystem. And we have two uh, of the people who have uh, uh, been working on this within the project now here, Olti Lova uh, from the University of Turku, who works as a university lecturer there at the Center for East Asian Studies and acts also as the vice director for the center. Um, uh, she is also the director of the Finnish University Network for Asian Studies. She is a specialist in Chinese society and politics, and her current research project analyzes China's innovation strategies and challenges in their implementation at the local level. And uh, she also has a central role uh, in the University of Turku, part of, of uh, a very large uh, recently started uh, EU Horizon funded project Reconnect China, which also has tangential relations to several of, of us in, in this project. So, please. Thank you, Michael, for your kind in introduction and, and a good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes. Uh, today, um, it has been mentioned several times that our perceptions of countries impact on how we act. And for that reason, I think it's important to have a realistic and nuanced understanding of our important partners. And um, in my presentation, um, I try to go behind these headlines that we have seen recently. And uh, because uh, these have a great impact on how we perceive China, and I think it's uh, important to, to understand uh, what's behind this. And uh, a closer look at the grassroots level helps us to show, uh, helps us to estimate uh, what China's innovation capability actually is. Uh, many China experts uh, say that, that we grossly overestimate China's ability to innovate. So, um, what are the challenges then and the strengths that we need to pay attention to in the Chinese innovation ecosystem when we look at it? 
So in this session, we will provide you two different perspectives on this topic. First, I will very shortly talk about um, China's innovation strategies and how they are implemented at the local level. And then after my very short presentation, Jinhua Zhu will uh, speak a bit longer about Chinese uh, innovation ecosystem at large. So uh, where to go uh, if we want to have a more realistic picture of the state of science and technology uh, innovation in China? So uh, in my presentation, um, of course, I mean, there are many possibilities of how to do this. Uh, you can take a closer look at statistics and, and learn how to uh, really understand better Chinese statics, statistics, which are really tricky to read. Or then you can also take a look behind uh, bigger companies such as Huawei, what's going on there. Uh, but then my presentation looks uh, at cities and what's going on uh, at grassroots level. What happens when the national strategies are implemented in cities and what happens to the funds when they are put into action there. And in fact, it's very important to look at cities because um, since the start of the tech war, uh, China, China's leadership now wants to uh, expand the, the scope of, of innovation investments beyond the coastal regions to uh, also cities in inland and central China. And, and uh, that has an impact on how these funds are used. So uh, in recent regulations from uh, 2019 and, and 2021, for example, these uh, encourage and in fact uh, force the localities to create local innovation ecosystems with local characteristics. And, um, and this means that, that all the 700 Chinese cities have to put a share of their investments in, in science and technology. So these investments are scattered throughout the China. So, so the huge numbers that we see so, uh, are in fact spread all over the, the huge country to areas that not, not necessarily are very fertile for uh, investments. So in the process of directing investments to, to localities, uh, there are many challenges that then can turn the investments, investments sour. And this can happen, um, oh, here we can see the, the scope of uh, China's research and, and development spending last year, staggering numbers. And 60% and of this goes to coastal regions, whereas 40% goes to uh, inland regions. So uh, when looking at what is happening with this investment, so we can look at policies, how they're in, uh, formulated um, and how they are used in practice, and then also the diffusion of the uh, innovations when they are put into practice and into economically productive uh, activities. So first, um, recent research by Heindl has, has shown that the top-down uh, policies designed in Beijing, they have not been very successfully implemented in lo localities because they are, they are uh, kind of uh, planned by, by Beijing and they not pay attention to the local features. Second problem is, is with the use of subsidies and this uh, study by, by Bowen and, and Peters really provides staggering figures about how uh, subsidies have been misused in, in localities. And um, they found out that the, um, uh, in the coastal areas, the use of, of these uh, subsidies are more effective because uh, coastal areas have better uh, environment for productive and meaningful investments, whereas in, in other parts of China, uh, it's then easy to, to find, <laughs> well, it's, not, it's not that easy to put them into, into meaningful uh, uh, objectives, but then instead they go to corruption, buying in fancy cars or building uh, institutes with no, no real uh, research and um, uh, scientific activities, but then other uh, activities. Then also, especially since the start of the tech war and the um, issuance of the new, new um, 
uh, rules and regulations and, and, and uh, more funding to research and uh, innovation. Uh, because there is so much funding now available, so, so some Chinese researchers have, have uh, seen the, the, the uh, or are very concerned about the use of funding to, to uh, very uh, fragmented pro programs and, and a project that don't uh, kind of contribute to the development of, of, of a good uh, science uh, innovation ecosystem. And, and this is something that's uh, really caused uh, a lot of concern in, uh, among the scientists themselves. And then the last one is a problem with innovation diffusion that is seldom paid attention to when looking at Chinese statistics about uh, uh, patents and, and, and publications. Uh, this is a recent a research by Jeffrey Ding from 23 where he pays attention to the fact that that in fact, despite the high number of innovations, the diffusion of these innovations into, into economic actual uh, uh, activities is, is uh, very weak. So he really uh, states clearly that, um, that China is far from being a science and technology superpower because the diffusion defici deficit is so large. So uh, if we quickly look at a place where China is now investing heavily after first in the 80s, uh, putting a lot of uh, investment in, in the south and then into Shanghai region in the early 2000s to Beijing region and now to the central China to the twin city region of Chengdu and Chongqing. So uh, they are building uh, massive numbers of eco cities, smart cities, digital cities, and also this one. Um, there will be a Western Science City, both in, in, uh, located in Chengdu and, and, and Chongqing. And you can see here a big number of, of various projects that will take place there or are under planning. And this seems to be the kind of the signature project of this region. Um, if we look closer, uh, what they are going to do in this area. So, uh, looking at these, these five-year plans of science and innovation um, of these uh, two cities, and then also the outline for the whole package. So, um, if we look at the four problems that I mentioned earlier, what's going to happen with them? So, um, first, the top-down localization of, of policies that has not been very effective. So in this case, it looks already a bit better because the local plans uh, pay a lot of attention to local strong sectors and, and there is, uh, I, I'm optimistic that this problem is not that relevant uh, anymore. Then this orderly and too fast development of new institutions, here the risks are imminent, imminent because uh, reading these plans, you can, you can find the mentions of tens of tens of eco cities, science parks, uh, smart cities, and so forth. So the risk of, of having lots of empty buildings there without any actual activities is, is huge. Uh, mi misappropriation of, of funds. Uh, this was um, a big problem for regions with a uh, bad uh, innovation ecosystem. And now both Chengdu and Chongqing are among 20 leading cities in China with regard to uh, investment and, and innovation uh, in, uh, infrastructure. So uh, in this respect, uh, risks for, for uh, uh, misappropriation is, is becoming lesser, but it's still evident. And as to diffu diffusion deficit, it's still difficult to estimate because uh, this is a prog ongoing program progress. And, uh, but as this is a, uh, evident at national level, so, so probably this is going to be a big problem in uh, uh, that region as well. So um, it's certain that the uh, Twin City will become a very important center for innovation in China, but it's also certain that there will be significant challenges on the way. And linking this to the topic of the seminar, if it's successful, the Twin City region and other regional growth poles, they will reduce China's dependence of for, on foreign uh, technology, and at the same time, they will enhance China's global competitiveness. It's also 
um, clear that uh, we need close scrutiny when analyzing China's future ability to use its innovation capacity to exert leverage. Thank you for your attention. I had a set of, I hope, uh, very interesting uh, sessions already, and we have now one final concluding uh, panel left with a discussion where we're looking a bit ahead into the future. Um, and we have some interesting panelists here. Sean uh, uh, Bresner will introduce uh, the ones that you have not seen yet. But before this, I'd just uh, briefly like to take the opportunity here um, to say a few words also um, about uh, the research group. We actually had our very first project meeting in the same location. Uh, not in this room, <laughs> but we, we did get a very nice room for a decent price because it, it was in the darkest hour of the uh, COVID uh, uh, pandemic, so nobody was here basically, so we got bumped up to a very nice room for a very cheap price. And we had the first one day session here. So that's why we thought it would be sort of the circle is closing, it's nice to conclude uh, this uh, project in the same place we started. And we have cooperated, as you've noticed, uh, with a lot of scholars who have not been perhaps part of a core group, but you saw here, uh, for example, Jinhua uh, gave a very interesting uh, presentation. We have cooperated with uh, UI's uh, NKK, with, with Björn Kappelin. Matt Furchin has been very active. Uh, he is based at Yale University and unfortunately could not be here today, but he has definitely contributed a lot to the project. Um, we have uh, Tero Poutala, who is also another doctoral researcher who has been involved. Mikko Rajavori from the University of Turku. So we have a, a broad range of people with whom we have uh, cooperated, collaborated and co-authored. And some of those links, of course, will continue uh, onwards. Uh, but I would particularly like to take this opportunity to uh, thank those people who have done the brunt of the work, uh, especially for, for the report here. So Lisa. Kauppila, whom you've seen already a couple of times today, Elina Sinkonen, of course, and Ines Söderström, who has been here in the background all the time, fixing when technical things go wrong, has been uh, invaluable for, uh, for this project. And voice acting in the comics. <laughs> <laughs> voice acting in the comics, in case you didn't notice, that was... Uh, <laughs> wait, uh, there was one where you were holding your nose, I think, so... Uh, who did I forget? And of course, uh, also, uh, I would like to thank also the, the people here at camp and, and, uh, and the people from FIA, Maya Salon in particular, who has helped us in, in set up this, this final event. Did I forget somebody? Sean, of course. You're standing right behind me. <laughs> I've done that. Okay. So anyway, we have had a fantastic research group and, and, and this uh, final uh, panel, I hand now over uh, the microphone to you, Sean. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. And so we've already met two, uh, two of the members of the panel earlier on. So I'm just going to introduce uh, Sinikuka Sari, who is the research director at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, works on Finnish security, NATO, great powers, former Soviet space, would that be fair to, to say, uh, and future studies as well. And Christian Fjeda, who, uh, despite his academic background, has uh, now also a, 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 I was going to say a foot in, but it's more than a foot in, a very strong presence in uh, the commercial world. He's CEO of Geostrategic Intelligence Group. Uh, before that, he worked as Director for Policy Planning and Analysis at the National Emergency Supply Agency, so knows a little bit about threats and uh, insecurity. But I think uh, to start this off with, we'll, we'll just have a few preliminary comments from the... Um, from the, from the panellists, and, and then I'll read some of the questions. I've put a few of them to, together. So I'll start with Sierke, because the, I'm really fascinated by this whole idea of the future and what is the future, you know? When we talk about future studies, how future is the future that we're talking about? I mean, what is the, the time scale, do you think, that we should be adopting or looking at? What's the time horizon when we're trying to, to think about potential insecurities in the future? So thank you for the question. It's really at the core of future studies and future thinking. But let's pause for a moment what the future is, the whole concept of future. I can tell you future is here, today, now, in your mind. It's a paradox. 
future is not something that is years and centuries ahead and then coming towards us. It's already here. When you think about the future, it is a concept that is, exists ontologically, cognitively. It exists already now. So future is here paradoxically. And it is not irrelevant what kind of choices, what kind of plans we have concerning the future. Because when we start then implementing them, it has an impact on the future that is going to happen. But the time horizon, it's also an interesting and relevant question. And that varies. In future studies, 10 years is really the minimum that we can talk about the future. Um, rather 50 years, even 100 years, and even beyond. But uh, here, of course, uh, we have to take the stance that we are at the same time taking a very long-term uh, horizon perspective, and at the same time we have to be agile, proactively, response to crises and risks. Uh, uh, thank you. So if we move on to uh, Alina. My eldest granddaughter is called Alina, so I have to take great care. <laughs> um, you've done a lot of the actual work on the, on the project. Put that to one side, put your professional responsibilities uh, to one side for a little while. What are the things that you personally think that we should be focusing on in terms of insecurities for Finland in the, in the future, however defined, uh, that perhaps weren't covered in the report? Well, one big theme that uh, hasn't been mentioned too much, maybe indirectly so far, um, is the climate change issue, of which I'm not really an expert on, but I thought that somebody should say a few words about it. Because the fact that uh, unless we drastically change the course, densely populated areas um, in India and Pakistan and elsewhere will become inhabitable uh, due to rising temperature, which can cause huge migration flow, uh, flows and violent conflicts. And not to mention the new diseases that may form if people live too densely and close to wildlife. Compared to such developments, COVID-19 pandemic might look in the future like a garden party. Uh, so my background covers uh, to a certain extent great power uh, relations, so of course great power uh, relations matter also in the climate change context. Prior to Paris Agreement it was essential that US and China agreed upon common targets, uh, but there is little left of the spirit of cooperation today. Uh, this might bring some really gloomy future scenarios into mind, but actually uh, there are also counterintuitively positive developments hap that have happened uh, during um, the time when the great power relations have not been in such a good shape. China pledged to become carbon neutral by 2060 during Trump's presidency, and uh, which started mega investments booms in China related to everything uh, on green transition. Uh, and in recent years, green energy production has become profitable. Uh, both countries, US and China, are investing in them in selfish reasons. China wants to become and be the global leader in climate technologies. And I'm quoting or drawing some of these ideas from Lauri Müllevirta's presentation. He spoke at the opening session of FIA's new climate center uh, last week. And he finds that China will continue its investments in, in uh, all the green technologies if its competitors will also do so. So if we want China to uh, uh, proceed in this common goal of uh, uh, environmental saving the environment, then we have to keep on investing in our own uh, green sectors as well. Uh, so, of course, uh, it would be better to have good great power relations rather than bad ones, because then we could all be more efficient. Um, and there is the risk that recent US trade policies, such as semiconductor controls, may hinder climate tech development in China, which will then slow down the whole process of improving the situation. From a small country perspective, I will finish really soon. Um, combating climate change is, of course, really challenging, uh, especially if we want to avoid creating new dependencies. Uh, Finland can contribute uh, through EU, of course, 
And it also seems obvious that it's not a good idea to cut on research funding uh, on green transition because not only to combat climate change, we also want to ensure that Finnish companies can have their share of the cake as, as the great powers and uh, uh, other actors are investing in uh, climate tech. Competition is tough. And when we continue the discussion on China dependencies in green transition, we have to uh, go on the concrete level in Finland and think about questions such as what it means if we want to increase EU's, EU area self-reliance in energy transition minerals. Are we willing to open new mines in Lapland, although there are huge risks of environmental degradation near the mine and such questions? So things have two coins. We can be more self-reliant, but then we will have the downsides as well. So that's my my opening. Uh, yeah, but we might come back on to the environment. There is uh, a question on the environment um, that we might come back on to later on. So but we'll just leave that there. For, uh, for now, if I move to Christian, we've spoken a lot about what governments see in terms of risk and how they're responding to it, but... Does the world look different from a corporate uh, viewpoint? The, the companies see things in the same way? How do they cope with this apparently increasing geopolitical uh, confrontation or at least uh, contestation? Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Exactly. I think there probably is a bit of a disconnect there in, in, in the sense that uh, businesses do not always share the sort of government's uh, threat picture. and. Uh, and I mean, obviously, it just, it just starts from the fact that the, the, the function or the reason being for, for, for companies is very, is very different. So um, really just to produce profit to the capital their owners have invested in. And so they're very much care of the sort of direct impacts and sort of immediate impacts. And what companies tend to do um, to sort of tackle this challenge is to um, actually conduct political risk assessments. And I think this is sort of a very illustrative of the sort of um, problems in, in how businesses see how little they perhaps understand this sort of systematic change we are experiencing in this world of strategic competition and geopolitical conflict because they traditionally have really focused in political risk uh, fairly narrowly on target markets. So basically it's been country risk studies conducting, seeing whether there are potential risks uh, of really essentially from Western point of view government uh, misconduct in the sense of re uh, appropriations of assets or uh, political instability, civil wars and the like. And this is natural because it's a very, political risk is a very Western construct actually, a uh, very sort of liberal construct. So in, and essentially they're looking at these sort of temporary problems uh, in market access and, 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 and profit generation in, 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 in individual markets. Now, obviously, that doesn't work really in this type of environment. Now, a lot of these risks are, are really transnational in nature. So, uh, take an example of the secondary sanctions, for instance. Uh, you know, might not get into trouble in, in terms of anything or because of anything you do in China but you may get into trouble because you are dealing with, uh, for instance, Chinese, Russian and other sanctioned uh, entities that are on the U.S. sanctions list, and then you get into trouble um, with, with the U.S. government. The other, I think, sort of fundamental word point of view is also that um, I think the political risk governments, have, the businesses haven't really focused on their home countries very much at all and that might be something new coming up in the sense that uh, again we kind of had this notion that in western countries actually liberal countries the government maintains an arm's length of business so it doesn't intervene uh, very easily uh, actually avoids intervening in, in directly in business uh, in some countries like Finland even sort of based on, 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 on sort of constitution that there is this entrepreneurial uh, freedom uh, now that's probably gone uh, the state is back. To what extent, how, how intrusive their intervention will be, to what extent it will go, is the big sort of uncertainty uh, that, that businesses should be thinking about. I don't think Western governments are probably going to mimic the authoritarian, authoritarian countries, but there's a big sort of change in the underlying thinking and the way uh, the Western governments also see the world. So if before there was this during 
the golden years of globalization, there was this very sort of optimistic view of, of interdependence, this sort of sensitivity interdependence. So the more countries trade um, with each other, the more sensitive they become to each other's interest, and there's this sort of pacifying effect in that. Governments now see interdependence more from a point of view of vulnerability mm. uh, interdependence. So I, I think it's under safe to assume that government intervention will increase. It probably, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to go to the sort of uh, level of, of, uh, of the authoritar authoritarian states actually conduct their, their businesses in this regard. But that is a big uncertainty. So we, we don't know how the role of the Western governments will change in this strategic uh, competitive environment. And we don't know how that will affect how the role of the businesses will change as well. And just finally, I think since we talk about future, um, basically traditionally political risk has sort of focused on events that have happened and their implications. So they look at if a country has had a lot of uh, political instability, say the civil war, you know, its rating goes up uh, when things sort of new government comes in and things start sort of pacifying, the rating sort of goes down. And, and that's quite unrealistic as well since we really um, should be cons concerned about where this systematic change is going to go because that really dictates how governments will act, how relations between governments will, will develop and how relationships between government and business will, will develop. Maybe I'll leave it here for, for now. Thank you. Yeah, what, what I'll uh, do is see if there's any questions after the first round. Sineke, uh, I'm really... You work on Russia and you've got a foresight dimension to your work and, you know, we've been talking a lot about China, but there's, a, you know, a war not very far away from, from here. I mean, how, how far do you think the... Uh, the, the people got Russia right or wrong and, and how do people like all of us here sort of feed our expertise into hopefully trying to improve the um, predictive power of government policy and expectations about countries like Russia? Uh, great, thank you. I will definitely um, answer your question as well but if you may I would like to also address the title of this panel which was how to enhance small state preparedness. <laughs> Um, uh, I have worked at the foreign ministry and done foresight projects there. I have also worked in the EU context and tried to offer policy advice on, on Russia uh, in that setting as well. And now I work as a, as a researcher. So I think that it would be uh, interesting to kind of compare the notes and, and see what's, you know, if we are baking a... Um, preparedness cake, what would be the ingredients in it? So uh, my recipe for small state preparedness would be that first of all, what we really need is knowledge-based uh, decision-making. Um, and I think this Forex uh, project is a very good example of how you can try to bridge the gap between academic research uh, and then political decision-making. I'm sure that uh, the results of this uh, marvelous project are very relevant for decision making and their relevancy really comes from, uh, uh, from the rigorous academic research that you have, you have done. Uh, so I think it's really a win-win. Um, but, uh, and now I probably come to the uh, Russia, <laughs> Uh, case as well because it's it's all very clear and it's very easy to agree on this point but when it uh, you know in principle but when it comes to uh, practice then it's much much more complicated and I speak from my own experience that it definitely wasn't the lack of um, kind of critical uh, voices um, alarming <laughs> or trying to alarm uh, um, kind of the general public and decision makers on, on Russia-related risk. I think that there were quite a few of us, uh, but the reaction very often was that uh, this is politically motivated, fear-mongering, and I didn't really see that people were <laughs> really um, criticizing 
our research uh, from this kind of very constructive uh, manner than Circa was earlier today, kind of criticizing, but in a very constructive academic manner when you, when you really, uh, the critique is targeted on your research framework and what is missing there. And it's kind of the um, academic review of things. But rather, it is often very personalized and, and aggressive, in particular when uh, your research conclusions don't really confirm the political <laughs> agenda uh, of certain actors. Um, so there is that. But uh, the second ingredient uh, on my list is, um, is really futures-oriented analysis. And I would also suggest that this could be a good way uh, to bridge that gap and try to kind of um, try to, uh, you know, if we have very polar polarized uh, debate, for example, on certain matter, for example, on China, uh, then perhaps uh, futures oriented analysis and scenarios can provide a way forward uh, in a kind of constru a constructive manner that you are not only preparing for the most likely scenario but you also work through all the alternative scenarios on the table as well. Uh, so in a way, you are prepared for the worst if it comes to that. Um, uh, so that is very important for small countries, I think, uh, like Finland. So you have to be ahead of the curve rather than reacting to the things when they have already um, unfolded. Um, and then the third and final point will be uh, the importance of having very inclusive preparedness processes and analysis. Um, and um, like Elena mentioned that you were surprised how differently, for example, business people uh, answered uh, or advised you uh, in your scenarios earlier today. I think this, this is very important, that you have to have kind of um, people from different backgrounds, obviously, um, uh, engaged in the exercise. And I think that the more diverse the groups are, uh, the more credible and probably more innovative uh, the anal analysis will be. So that's one thing. But then I think it's also a question of preparedness. Uh, now we have really talked about state actors a lot, like China is a threat, Finland is, you know, needs to be prepared. Uh, but one has to, rem uh, has to remember that oftentimes the first line of defense or preparedness in this case is actually on a local um, or municipal level. Uh, or perhaps it is indeed a private firm that has to react to to certain things. So I think that it is very important that in particular in small countries that we um, share the situational awareness and we share the analysis and so we have diverse groups and the analysis is also shared uh, in public. So. Thank, thanks very much. You've actually in that answer or uh, covered one of the first questions <laughs> afterwards I was going to so we, that does create just a little bit of time to see if there's any direct responses to the things that you've, you've just heard from the panellists here. Um, okay. <laughs> Finally, I get to ask questions as well. So, yeah, I think what, what the cynical I just uh, uh, finished with is, is a very important uh, question. Um, I, I believe there's a theory out there that's called socionomics or something like that. Well, basically, as far as I understand it, it goes that uh, we human beings are, are, of course, social animals. So we, we care very much about other people's views. And we continuously adjust also our views to sort of fit in with what other people, what, what, with what is sort of socially acceptable. And, and that's, uh, that's, of course, just on the general level. But we know foreign policy uh, research, uh, one very long-term strand is, is groupthink. Uh, which, is, uh, which happens in, even in, best, in the best of circumstances sometimes. Even in elite groups is supposed to have a lot of knowledge. They tend to also be, care very much about sort of their peer, peers and their, their views and their standing. And I, I've thought a lot about this, especially now in the context of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the aggression uh, against uh, Ukraine and how we got that wrong. 
and how, if you remember, I mean, Finns were very relaxed about this thing. I think there was even a survey that said we, we, we were the most, just about the most relaxed in the EU just before, uh, what, like two, two months, three months before that. Um, and that was even in the, in the sort of decision makers, uh, making uh, uh, sphere, it seems there was a lot of, uh, 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 there was this reluctance to, to accept what a lot of people were saying. Uh, so it's not generally um, uh, uh, sort of necessarily a good, uh, uh, good for your career to be right too early or at the wrong time. And that really means that you, you have to overcome this challenge uh, in order to say, to get the message across. And now I'm worried a little bit about uh, that we have gone to the other end with, when it comes to, to China, that there's, it's very hard to get across um, a, a, how to say, I mean, I just heard uh, two days ago that nuance, if you use the word nuance, it means you've been compromised. If you weren't you use nuance on China, you've been compromised. So I, I shouldn't say nuanced, <laughs> but, but in this media environment, how do we get across something if it's not uh, sort of just echoing what the media feeds us, what the, what the public uh, wants to hear right now at this very moment for reasons that we all understand? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody want to come back? Uh, to yeah, please. Well, all I can say is that I completely agree. And uh, yes, I would suspect that now the kind of public mood has definitely changed and all interdependencies are looked uh, from a security angle almost exclusively. And now we probably are at the other end. I mean, but Christian, you can continue from there. Yeah, uh, first, first of all, that sort of discussion kind of raised an old trauma, so I kind of want to acknowledge my problems as well. So when I was still with NESA, we did um, the security supplies scenarios 2013, um, uh, late 2017, and, and uh, we came up with four distinct scenarios, so four distinct sort of uh, future paths. In three of them, Finland eventually joined NATO. And uh, unfortunately, well, it was kind of interesting, actually, peculiar, I got emails and, and, and um, phone calls from certain influential uh, persons to erase the mentions of NATO membership because it wasn't part of Finnish foreign policy. And I nicely tried to explain that, well, in the context of this scenario that we had described here, it probably would be. And that is the point. It's not the point that it's not now. Um, we're telling you that in 20 years' time, under these circumstances, it would be a viable choice. And so I'm, I'm not saying this to complain, but it's sort of uh, kind of actually a uh, segue to what, what, what Sinikukka said, that um, there's this difference in language as well. And I, I think it's quite a, important that uh, we use in government and national security circles, especially we use very sort of threat-based language. And, and for modern business leaders that are by nature more sort of optimistic, uh, because it's by nature, and not also because it's their job. It just sounds too um, aggressive a lot of times. So this could be a sort of one, or one I don't know, a solution, but patch up could be actually to think about the language as well and more think in terms of the risk. So a threat is something bad that can have happen, an event or act that can cause negative impacts. And the risk is the probability or the likelihood and impact of that actually happening. And vulnerability is something that makes that you vulnerable to, to, to that uh, impact. So maybe just sort of sharpen on the language sometimes as well. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I come from a country where there's a big debate at the moment over whether China should officially be called a threat or something else. Thierke, you wanted to... Yeah, I quickly want to add that future studies really gives us freedom, a safe space space and place to think in alternatives, not in predictions. In future studies, we don't make predictions, exact predictions. So that frees us to think in a dialogue way on alternatives, different possibilities, and then kind of have this uh, ongoing future dialogue, which is uh, very recommended. Thank you. Uh, you had a two-finger response? Yes, uh, this was just a reaction to what Christian said. That um, An interesting point is that often it is, and perhaps it could be that Elena's points earlier today also kind of reflect this, but um, uh, that often it is that authorities uh, are concerned about risks and 
well, risks or threats or whatever, uh, whereas, you know, um, kind of private enterprises see future in terms of opportunities. So that would be also the importance of combining the forces uh, uh, in, the, um, in the thinking and analysis pro uh, process that, you know, you would get both. Yeah. Lynn, do you want to comment or do you want to move to the next? Uh, well, I could just um, really briefly comment on like a more, more general level uh, integrating the expert opinions uh, into the public debate. It's really challenging because some of these big challenges that we have are so complex and, and it's, it's, well, I've been commenting in the media, some of them, and you will always have to leave uh, like half of your multiple angles out and simplify so much that then the, the problem becomes a different one that you, are, you would actually study in an academic paper. And then there are also these like problems that we are facing nowadays and will face increasingly in the future. The complexity kind of <laughs> goes on a different, uh, different level when you come uh, have uh, issues like AI regulations that Junhua was speaking about. Do the pu public in most countries understand anything about the technical features or the possibilities of what AI can create? It can take away people's jobs, but uh, how to engage them in a way that would be like engage them in this somehow, even though they might not have any way of understanding the complexities uh, regarding the technical features or, or so forth. Thank you. I, I mean, I had a, um, a list of questions, but it's already gone out the window because one of them's part, largely been answered already. And a later one has been raised already by Christian. You mentioned NATO, right? And one of the questions is, Enhancing small states' preparedness. Well, what difference does NATO membership make for Finland? Uh, is it a fundamental game changer? Well, it's 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 a change of um, fundamentals in, in in terms of the sort of thinking and and, and starting points because um, so far Finland, as a small state, has sort of prepared to um, maximize its autonomy as far as a small state can and and act alone. And uh, obviously now there is the sort of prospect of actually assistance from our allies, um, but also the fact that the relationship is also two ways. So um, Finland now needs to take into account its preparedness planning, also how it's going to support its allies if, if they are in crisis. So, you know, it is, but um, sort of feeding into the discussion we just had, I think things are just not black and white in general. So there are these sort of shifts and, you know, systematic change is happening little by little and, and slowly. So I don't, I don't think there's, we should too much be too fatalistic and talk about, you know, too, in too, de too deterministic way about these sort of fundamental shifts before they have happened. It's good to acknowledge their possibility and think about what they could cause, um, what, what, what could cause them. But we shouldn't actually sort of jump into conclusions and, and, and just start preparing for World War III or new Cold War necessary. They, they, are, they are possible, but you know, still quite unlikely. And, and uh, we're not helping ourselves if we sort of just sort of go into that uh, mode right away, uh, right now. Anybody else like to comment on NATO? It's part of your... Well, I think... Uh... I think that the first reaction in Finland has been more that, you know, um, this won't change that much, that we will still primarily be responsible for the defense of our own territory. But um, although that might be true, um, I think there is important uh, difference now that somehow that our national security is international. So perhaps, uh, you know, the mental shift is way bigger than perhaps, you know, certain practicalities on the ground might suggest. And one thing that comes to my mind is I, I will keep my eye on, on the definition of dual use technologies, whether that will broaden uh, due to the NATO, NATO membership in the future. Okay, let's move to questions of uh, effectiveness, because we have a couple 
of those. There was one very specific on the way that the Chinese intelligence services target uh, intellectual property. But I guess the broader question is, uh, thinking back at the, um, the mechanisms that have been introduced in Finland so far, how, how effective do you think they are in actually providing security for this small state? Uh, do you think that Finland is well prepared for the future or there's still a long way to go? <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to avoid this because um, I think my passive... On, on a view, personal <laughs> level, not... On a, a personal level, level I, I, I wouldn't be too confident. And the reason I'm saying this is there's, there's sort of two, two issues at, at play here. Um, uh, Lena was already hinting to this sort of expanding dual use, and, but it, we already have a very broad understanding of of security supply, for instance, of uh, societal resilience and societal security. So it's just getting more and more sort of uh, topics added there. And at the same time, we're not really increasing necessary resources or coordination efforts in terms of um, making those happen in, in real life. So small group of people will just continue sort of addressing a, a broader, uh, broader range of topics and, and, and challenges and risks. Um, so I'm sure we um, get lucky sometimes and, and, and catch some, but I don't. I don't really think it's, it's we the level that we can confidently say that um, we capture all the critical risks. I'm not sure. Just to finish off, we actually should aim at that either. So again, there's this sort of basis of realism that we should define better what is critical. Not everything can be critical. That is, there's this common trap nowadays, not just in Finland, but in a lot of Western countries that we, we're starting to securitize more and more things and more and more things become critical. That's not the solution. And I think we've been heading that way uh, without really strengthening the mechanisms, like I said, to the same extent. Well, it's just dangerous to be small. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fact, even if you are allied. I would say that uh, if uh, um, my recipe had three ingredients, I think that all of those are kind of addressed in the national preparedness planning for sure. Um, but there might be a, also a tendency to be complacent and that's always dangerous. So I share the analysis. Yeah. <coughs> Any more on that? Um, and then there's a question about there is a degree of scepticism, I think, about the reliance on technological solutions in the future. Um, so the question is, you know, can we really depend on these technological solutions or are we really um, expecting too much? And I know that um, some people, for example, will look at the, the, the supposed solutions to the environmental crisis that haven't quite come along yet and resolved problems. So please see. Yeah, I think this uh, question concerning technology is really relevant here. And uh, in your study, uh, you um, identified this cluster of techno-oriented um, approach, but uh, it was really technology deterministic view, I think. The expert views were all on that side. And in future studies, this technology foresight niche is looking now more towards abandoning technology uh, determinism. And we are trying to have a look at uh, technology as an enabler and also anticipating all kinds of risks and threats. And especially, of course, AI is a case in point where UN is at the moment uh, going to do something about it, how we could develop AI uh, so that the next phase will be detrimental to humanity. So it's related to existential threats even. But I'd like to pose also a question to you. How about another field of technology, space technology? We are going to globally trying to colonize space and that obviously will have political ramifications and implications, and even small states um, are going to be involved in somehow in this space. So the comprehensive security concept 
should include now explore, uh, uh, reflections on space technology use. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's, um, it's really hard to think about tech. Well, there is fusion energy. We've been waiting for the breakthroughs for, <laughs> for I don't know how long. There have been some small uh, advancements recently, but still no, not like a real, real breakthrough. Uh, so, so in the environmental scene, there is, of course, this big debate how much you can rely on technolo technological solutions and how much you, we, you should just cut your uh, consumption and period and not try to sell it to the public so that some, some tech solution will come in the future and nobody has to do anything unpleasant uh, in the present. Uh, but then we have big innovations like internet and electricity which transformed how humans live and at the, those times when these inventions were made of course, they came sort of suddenly to the, the laymen, <laughs> the common people, and, and changed everything. So, of course, sometimes you do have this. It's, it's just really technical and hard to, to really know <laughs> when you would really need to be a technical expert to a certain extent to, to, to know. Let's just go across the table now, Christian. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, I, I think technology obviously holds a lot of potential in terms of assisting us to, to, to solve a lot of the great problems that uh, we, we currently have may encounter. But it has, of course, its limitations as well. So if you think in terms of, um, for instance, I've been in some discussions about the potential of AI in intelligence. And um, obviously, since we live in this sort of information-rich environment, AI can actually boost the in intelligence services capabilities quite a bit in terms of providing quick and accurate analysis and all that. But then if we put that into sort of uh, context of societal resilience or national security, uh, the problem at least this phase still or in, in the near future is that uh, there's a lot of values-based decisions that need to be made there. And, and somebody needs to take accountability for the consequences of those decisions as well. So let's say we put an AI to um, analyze the, the critical electricity grids and and, um, and, and, and simulate a, a major disruption and then tell us whether we should, for instance, switch off electricity in Lapland in order to, to, to actually um, have uh, enough power for the central sort of industrial and population centers like Helsinki, for instance. It can probably do that, but you know, it won't at least take the accountability for the, the suffering that those smaller numbers uh, with that sort of calculation will suffer. So, you know, I, I think it can be great help, but I don't know if technology really solves these sort of human problems necessarily. Good. Do I have to? <laughs> you don't have to if you don't want to. No. Um, let me just say that I'm sure that technology will change, transform the ways that we live, but not, not necessarily uh, in ways that we now expect. So, uh, so let's be prepared for surprises. I just have one from if you, anybody has sort of uh, ever read Rand's work in, in, in future studies from the 50s. Uh, they were pretty sure by now monkeys would be driving cars for us. <laughs> so I just leave it to that. So there is um, a, f a final question that I want to ask about future studies, but I'm going to put that on hold because we have about five minutes for any questions from the audience before we move to that final big question. So if there's anything you've been desperately wanting to ask and haven't had the chance, I can see one hand so far.
OK, so let's go in reverse order this time and feel free to answer all, some or none of the, uh, the questions that have uh, just been raised as you see fit. Um, well, yeah, yes, of course, um, there is a possibility uh, of self-fulfilling uh, prophecies and, you know, if you're looking for, some, yeah, I, I, I can see that logic uh, definitely. But on the other hand, I mean, I guess the essence of being a small state is really that you can't really, you know, frame the global <laughs> issues on the table. Uh, so, for example, like, at least in Finland, we talk about small state realism, which means that, you know, you have to survive in the kind of geopolitical setting that you are located and you can't really be the one who frames. I don't know, perhaps our Swedish friends, I don't know whether we have Swedish friends here in the room, uh, they have a different type of foreign policy tradition, perhaps, where it is a bit more ideological. Uh, but I think the way in which you put it sounds very kind of exotic to my Finnish ears. <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, but I mean, it sounds a bit like, you know, the uh, German pacifists that are saying that we shouldn't uh, uh, give arms to, to Ukraine because we love peace, you know. So uh, we have to think something else, but I think that, yes, we should be aware of uh, self-fulfilling prophecies and should be uh, critical of those and also try to uh, formulate ideas in a kind of a better way. And also perhaps here again, the future studies might help because you can think about different uh, 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 just a, a small addition to what Sinikoka just said. In the small studies literature, there is, uh, like, if you look at historically, there was this period earlier when the Nordic countries could impose these normative ideas and they had a bigger role in the international arena. But then the general atmosphere was much better and much more cooperative, and now the great power competition has been increasing, which makes it more difficult to, to kind of talk about world peace and, uh, and all the nice things. Yeah, um, first of all, I agree with Sini Kuka, and um, the only sort of, I guess, reservation I put, put on that is that, yes, we shouldn't bandwagon others in our perceptions and in our narratives and, and, and go into that trap of self-fulfilling prophecies, but as a new ally in the probably will ban back on, <laughs> so to be realistic. Uh, and, and we are living in the jungle, so we need to be aware of the lion. But um, the other question, I, I think I'll leave Elena now um, to answer about the dual uh, circulation strategy maybe, but um, that sort of question that I asked was, uh, I think, a very important one in the sense that it also reveals the difference between thinking between business and, and the civil sector and, and national security professionals because if we take the Huawei uh, issue for instance an example in a lot of countries it has been a very painful discussion in terms of how can you uh, target one or actually uh, ZT is another one but anyway one one individual sort of operator and uh, or business and, 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 and really sort of target uh, quite aggressive sort of uh, bans on them um, one of the really, I think, fundamental issues here is how we see risk in the national security side, how risk is seen, for instance, in business side. And, and for national security purposes, what's really important is the threat. So if you have a threat and you have a vulnerability to it, the risk doesn't really matter in the decision making. It's an acceptable risk from national security point of view usually. So if that threat is, is severe enough, so it threatens the sovereignty uh, of the country or, or, or its population, it is considered as a non-acceptable risk. And then the, uh, the threat and then the risk doesn't really matter. So that's, that's one thing. And just to sort of give a segue to Elena in terms of the, the Chinese strategy, yes, there is the dual circulation strategy. But um, again, connected to the Huawei issue, is it wasn't about the back doors ever really, uh, essentially the sort of technical um, uh, vulnerabilities. It was more the vulnerability of a, a potentially hostile state under so certain circumstances having the opportunity to use 
that dependence to inflict uh, harm. So um, again, it, 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 no matter how what the technical assessment was, it was a risk that um, you know these national security people weren't uh, willing to take. Um, so really, and um, I'm kind of lost my, my train of thought, actually. So to be quite honest, there was a final point about that I was going to make, but maybe it comes in my mind soon. Um, OK, yeah, the final point, sorry, was that maybe the Chinese intelligence law, which was mentioned in the report as well, and that, that was the vulnerability, basically. So um, Chinese companies would, could potentially be forced to, to cooperate with the, the Chinese authorities and inflict that pain in some circumstances. So How I guess, likely that is doesn't matter. Thank you. I think the strategy uh, questions got your name on it. <laughs> well, M Mikael still wanted to say something, so you can maybe take. Uh, he, wa he wanted to respond to a different question. Yes, yes, have okay. Yes. Uh, well, the authority is shot. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, I feel an urgent, even though I'm not on the panel, but I feel an urgent need to respond to your question. It's a, it's a very good one, but it's also a very difficult one. The, the short answer is yes and no. So if you go really back to the beginning, I mean, when, when the Chinese government started to, to want it, its companies to go outside, the uh, Chi policy, go out policy, there was a whole list of, of, of things that were listed there as, 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 as things that they, they wanted. So they wanted to grow their companies, grow their international markets, share, get, get the uh, know-how of management, uh, technology, resources, and so on. There was a whole list, but it wasn't just about uh, acquiring uh, companies in order to get hold of, of technology. But up until, I still remember, maybe 2015, the, the prevailing uh, sort of political economy explanation was that actually these, even these state-owned enterprises were going out because that was a way to come back in and be more competitive. So the Chinese domestic market was saturated with competition. They needed to grab market share outside to compete with other Chinese companies back in their domestic markets. And, and get hold of resources. So it comes really back to what Christian was saying, what has changed and why it's so difficult to answer this is because it's our perceptions have changed. So now very recent research says that it doesn't really matter if the company is, well, if the cat is black and white or black and white, it doesn't matter if it's an SOE or a private or whatever, because we cannot know for sure. And, and just a few years ago, uh, I mean, we're talking about Huawei, there was a lot of skepticism in Europe uh, about this American message that it's a problem. A lot of skepticism. But now we're not skeptic, more, uh, skeptical anymore. Uh, we don't want to take that small risk. So whether or not there is, and there may be a policy document somewhere saying that, but what really matters is how we perceive now that risk. Thank you. So yes and no, but only the yes matters <laughs> from national security point of view. Well, it, once it becomes securitized, it doesn't matter, right? It's the perception that, sh it, that is real rather than the reality. I, I, I shouldn't really say at this point, there is a section in my book from 2021 on exactly this question of whether it's a strategy, a grand strategy or not. And if anybody's interested, I will send them a PDF. <laughs> so I'm going to leave you the, the, the final word in answering those questions, but also one more I want to pose to you after you've dealt with these. What's the future of future studies? <laughs> Thank you, I like that question. But uh, I briefly comment on this uh, self-fulfilling prophecy or realizing narrative. We need narratives. Language is a very powerful tool and communication matters, but we all know at the same time that uh, information and facts can be manipulated and misinterpreted, so it is very important how you make the narrative, how you present it, and uh, what is the contents of the narrative. So actually I'm asking you, what is a proper resilient narrative for a small state to be future-proof? But I also claim that we can embrace risks, threats and crises. We should not be panicked because at the same time we can't escape all of them, but we can learn to prepare ourselves and trying to find solutions. In our academy-funded project Rescue for uh, Crisis Resilience for Cities, we, make, we are rehearsing futures. We have like, let's say, five crises that have already happened. Like in this room, we are in the middle of a crisis and we start thinking how 
to how to manage this situation and not just to cope, but also learn from the crisis and also renew our system or activities. And so to uh, this uh, uh, diamond question, we are addressing that question all the time, future of future studies. Uh, actually, future of future studies in an optimal form is that each sector, each field has future studies embedded, integrated, not to be a separate discipline, but all sectors, fields and uh, in society at large, even citizens could have this kind of futures consciousness, futures awareness, futures resilience. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I, I'm sure you appreciate it. it's quite difficult sitting here having questions fired at you uh, at this stage of the day. So before I hand over to the boss for the final words, I want to say um, two words of thanks. The first thanks is to you for providing such a, um, I, I think, really fulfilling hour of exchange here that has uh, certainly enriched my knowledge, and I'm sure everybody appreciates it. But also to everybody who is still here at, uh, at four o'clock, because, you know, it is a, a long day, and uh, without your input in terms of the questions here and um, the, the questions raised from the audience, we wouldn't have had such an interesting and lively discussion. So thank you both to the people here and to the people there. <laughs> And now I will hand over to the boss. Don't know about that boss, but uh, it's nice. <laughs> well, anyway, um, thank you very much to, for on my part as well. And um, uh, please uh, take a copy of the report if you haven't yet. Uh, they're, they're there for, for uh, taking. Uh, it's also available, of course, on the web. There's also that. Uh, executive summary if you don't have the time to read all of it. We very much appreciate also getting feedback uh, on it. This was the, the sort of the most, uh, the main policy relevant output of the project uh, on top of all the more academic uh, publications, but we definitely need, I mean, it's not uh, an end result, of course, it's, it's uh, something to feed into the policy making and, and, uh, but also something to work with uh, in the future. So we much appreciate getting your feedback also on it. Thank you very much. Thank you for staying with us uh, the whole day and um, hope to have more fruitful discussions with you in the future on these topics and others. Thank you. Thank you.